Hello and welcome to the round so far, brought to you by Amy. I'm Riley Beveridge. This is Kane Corns. Kane, it's been a big weekend in footy. Let's get straight into the action. Dream time at the G uh, tonight between Essendon and Richmond. It was a hard-fought battle, but the Bombers eventually getting over the line. Yeah, so this is when the game broke open late in the last quarter. It was a real struggle in the last quarter. Neither side could put one through, but there was Zach Merritt, the skipper, who was enormous once mm. again in length. But that kick from Caldwell was just unbelievable. He put it where he wanted Langford to go and he kicked three and put it through and here's the scenes. A much better and stronger performance yep. from Richmond who are really good around the football actually Certainly. got on top from stoppage. The difference in the game was the scores from turnover which has been a problem for Richmond all year but that is the effort that is mm. required from Richmond. No more of the excuses about the injuries and the reason for their poor form recently. That's the effort that you need to deliver regardless of who's on the park. Essendon now 8-2-1 and one on the season in the midst of a big winning streak. Two forwards on either end of the ground did the damage throughout this one. Jake Stringer kicked four goals for the Bombers and Dustin Martin returned to his best. 23 disposals and three goals. Yeah, how good. Both players playing a similar role, mainly inside forward 50. So Dustin Martin, less midfield time, a lot less midfield time, but he went forward and kicked that unbelievable goal. That got them going 23 touches, eight score involvements, three goals for Dustin. Then the packaging game, 200. <laughs> he's uh, done a bit of media this week. He seems like he's in a good place. Contract year for him, and he always plays good in a contract year. So it was just great to see these two powerful veterans, I guess, mm. doing what they were doing. That's not a mark, but it was paid a mark, <laughs> and I think it's only paid a mark because it's a superstar tax for Dustin Martin. Anyone else doesn't get that mark. But anyway, it was good to see him turn the clock back. In the end, it just wasn't good enough, albeit he threatened in the last quarter, mm. and you thought, oh, hang on, this could be one of the great upsets of the year, but not to be against a pretty resilient Essendon inside. Let's get to our Saturday star now, and it can only be one man, Jordan Ridley. His first game back from a quad injury. His first game since round 19 last year. Wins the Yayukin Award for best on ground in the dream time in the dream. What a performance. So he's taken eight intercept marks. The record's 10, and he had eight at the start of the last quarter. He thought he may break this record. His kicking tonight was just beautiful. Look at that. That splits the middle. So he went forward and kicked that goal. Um, and he was just enormous, as I said. Just his ability to hit these kicks and completely split open Richmond's defence. So really strong one on one. I didn't think Cumberland fought hard enough and you'll see a couple of examples of that where he just allows really to take back position, nudge him out of the way and take an easy intercept mark. But they will be so thrilled mm. to have this guy back. A lot of people think he's their most important player. Best and fairest winner, of course, signed a big contract extension. Frustrating year, but if they can get him in this sort of form yep. as they lead into what is now a certainty to play finals, then that can only be good news. One man who's had a number of important jobs throughout the season is Matt Guelphy. He locked down James Sicily, Lockie Whitfield. He had Nick Vloston tonight. Richmond can't afford to lose any more players, so this is a bit silly from, from one of their most experienced in Nick Flost and the elbow. You'll see a, a more closer angle soon, but do you have anything to worry about? No, I think it'll be a fine, but I just love what Guelph is doing. So you see the re replay there, and that's, that's a fine. It was silly, but yeah. what Guelph is doing is targeting the opposition's best intercepting defender, yeah. and he's going after them with a just a the Essendon edge mindset, I guess, is what it mm. is. There's a target on that play. He goes after them. Uh, in recent times, he's been able to go forward and kick a bag of goals. Not the case tonight, but to limit Vloston, who's been in good form, was another really key role for them. Let's get to GMHBA Stadium now, where the Giants secured a massive victory. They came into this one against the Cats with four defeats in their last five. Toby Green kicks that absolute ripper oh. to put them in front. And then some late efforts from a couple of their key defenders really stole He's the show. He's back. Toby's back his last two weeks. So kick two, had 24s involved in everything. Iden there was enormous. The kick from Dempsey was poor. I just thought they butchered the ball. Look, look, look at this last quarter. 24 entries to five, yet they could only kick two goals from it. They only took one mark inside forward 50 in the last quarter from 24 entries. Alia there. Uh, just, he was just unbelievable. His last two minutes of that game was huge. He took six intercept marks for the mm. game. So their ability, and they did it, remember, last year. They were under siege at times last year, but their defence just held up so well. That was a huge performance because yeah. all the momentum, the crowd started getting involved. Mm. 24 entries to able to absorb that and then have Toby Green lead from the front and get himself back into form in the last fortnight. A huge win in the context of their season. The fallout, I think, for the Cats is significant. Well, we mentioned last week that Geelong was struggling to contain opposition key forwards. Goldcoats got on top of them. And Jesse Hogan and Jake Riccardi kicked six goals between them this afternoon. Yeah, he kicked four. Riccardi, I stood here 
last week and says, yeah, they got an issue with their key forwards. Cadman and Riccardi couldn't get near it. Hogan's been enormous. I thought the Koning was really poor tonight. Watch him get front position here and get nudged underneath the ball yeah. a couple of times. One to Hogan, that one to Riccardi. That one there, he wasn't strong enough in the contest and Riccardi made the most of that. So De Koning was poor and he's got to review those defensive efforts that cost probably three or four goals tonight. But this was a good return to form. I mean, Hogan's been in great form there, getting yeah. in behind the defence. I thought just at times there, De Koning, you see him at the bottom of the screen. He didn't, he was just lost. Yeah. So their defensive structure, which is a real strength for Geelong, their back six and their team D, uh, at times really broke down um, and it was uncharacteristic. Can they still win the flag? You've got some concerns now. It's the first time they've lost four in a row since 2006. I wouldn't have thought so now. Yeah, no, premiership teams don't lose four games in a row and mm. they just get smacked in the midfield. Like Conway was monstered uh, today by Briggs, so they had to sub him out late. And then Blixarves goes into the ruck, not yeah. for the first time that that's happened. It happened with Stanley against Port Adelaide and they smashed around stoppage. So they did stand up in the last quarter, you just saw those numbers, but they just don't have enough star power with Dangerfield out through the midfield. Let's get to Marvel Stadium now where Carlton secured a really important win over Gold Coast, led by their skipper Patrick Cripps. He went head-to-head -head with Matt Rowell. He had 31 disposals and 13 clearances. Matt Rowell, 15 touches and two clearances, so clearly got the job done. Yeah, I love this from Cripps. I, I don't know who uh, instigated it, whether it was Voss or whether it was Hardwick and who mm. went to who. I suspect it was Cripps going to Rowell off what he did last week. And once again, to have that target or just that starting position for Cripps. Now, he's not a run with player. He's not a, ta a tagger, but to get that strong position early and then to go and win his footy, what was it, 10 clearances at half time for groups yeah. and 13 after the game. Absolutely huge. Best player on the ground. And that got everyone going, didn't it? In the end, um, Carlton, that's a really strong performance yeah. with all the challenges and all the injuries that they've got. The flip side to that is the fallout for Gold Coast, who we continually can't trust away from home. Yeah, 11 straight defeats now for Gold Coast away from home. Really interesting tactical battle, this, between Mac Andrew and Charlie Kerno. So Mac Andrew, I reckon, played the back-to-back -back Coleman medalist as well as anyone in the comp has throughout the first half. But then you're about to see here, Charlie Kerno didn't take a mark to half-time. But then for about 10 minutes in the third quarter, Mac Andrew goes into the ruck. And all of a sudden, Charlie Kerno breaks this game open as a contest. He takes two big contested grabs, kicks a couple of goals, finishes with four for the afternoon and changes the game in the second Just half. didn't get it right, did he, Damien Hartwig? That's all you can say about this. Very rare to have your second ruck come from a key defensive post and a key defensive post that has the Coleman medalist, the, the reigning two-time Coleman medalist, uh, held well held mm. at half-time. And he was in ripping, intercepting form himself. So I don't know why they'd be putting that guy, who appears to be if not the most exciting player in the comp, yeah. he's probably one or two with Sam Darcy. That, mm. That's how good this guy's going. And then to even risk him in the ruck, but then to take him off the great job he was doing for Kerno, I just think Damien Harwood got that wrong. Yeah, certainly agree there. All right, let's get to our moment now. It comes at Marvel Stadium. Lloyd Johnston, what a story he's been. We saw a great interview with him after the game last week when Gold Coast beat Geelong up in Darwin. How's this for a celebration? Kicks the goal, does the backflip, the standing start. <laughs> Comparing it to Fast Freddy over in, uh, in Fred Freo as well. Can you do that? <laughs> I'd like to see you give it a try right oh, here. Imagine. That is absolutely free. What about the incredible. athleticism in that? It Amazing. was great to see. All right, let's get to our Amy Clangers now. We start at Marvel Stadium where an overexcited Carlton fan, I think, in the crowd tries to take the big grab. Opens the Him gate. and his mate open the gate afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> he should have marked it first. What's How's he that? doing? Pull your pants up, son. Now, Patrick and Cripps. He caught one in the eye here. You just see the umpire come back and signal. <laughs> I'm not sure Cripper didn't see him and the umpire didn't see him clearly, but got a poke in the eye, got up, and finally saw the funny side of it. And what about this? The star of the show down at GMHBA Stadium, Lecalier. He's been signing autographs for about 10 minutes after the game. All of his Giants teammates are waiting for there him. There he is. He finally gets there to sing Good song, the song, too. All right, let's get to Friday night footy over at Optus Stadium where Fremantle and Collingwood played out. Pretty dramatic draw. You can see here the Dockers, they were 25 points down with just a couple of minutes left in this game. They fought back and they secured a draw. Yeah, second draw for the season. And one that, I mean, they were enormous. They were gallant. Everything that you could say about Collingwood with the injuries that they've got away from home Friday night, big stage. But in the end, you're 25 points up with seven uh, sorry, 25 points up with seven minutes to go. Yeah, you don't lose that game of footy. Yeah. Banfield's turning into a clutch performer. He was mm. huge in the last quarter. Kicked a couple of big goals. There's Young, and here they come, and then the crowd got involved, and Collingwood just made some errors. And the skipper went forward, Alex Pierce, and looked like he was been there all 
his career. Yeah. It's just his fourth goal for his career, but signaled to the sky for Cam McCarthy, of course. And then this one here from Sharp. Should you have kicked it? Yes, should have kicked it. That was just yeah. a shank, had time, had space, and he would have been the hero. He was really good, and mm. he's playing an important role for him. He's got genuine speed on the outside on the wing, but that was one that Fremantle, if they had of one, would have absolutely stolen. And there was a controversial moment late in this game where Sullivan, you can see here, he only played a couple of games, but he gets pinged for throwing the ball to Nick Dacos rather than back to the umpire. Now, under the rules, this goes as time-wasting. Free kick was given, 19-point margin there, gets it to back to within 13 points. It's a crucial part of this game. The AFL came out on Saturday morning and said that it was the correct Of course they did. Of course. It, says, it, is, it is the rule. Well, I know, but it's time-wasting. Look, he's blown time off there, so the clock's not even running. There's no time-wasting. The, the clock hasn't <laughs> even... How can it be time-wasting? So you've either got to rewrite the rule or the umpires has got to have a little bit more common sense and go, OK, he didn't delay the game here. This was... We're talking half a second. Yeah. Dacos, umpire. That's not time-wasting. Mm. Now, you're going to show me some other examples that have been well, paid this year. Well, it's happened five times already this season. So here are the previous five. Friday night was the sixth example. That one got... So that's fair. Two that that is time-wasting. You just chuck the ball up after holding it too long. Now, a couple of these ones also are when they, the, the player who's got in possession of the footy has taken too long to give it back to Not the umpire. Not time-wasting so that one. One where they took too long. This is another one where the umpires deemed they took too long rather than passing it to a teammate. So that's happened a couple of times as well. This one from Matt Kendi throws the ball to Pitney, so that's an example similar to what we saw mm. on Friday night where he throws it to a teammate. And then Tom Liberatore, the final one here, this is the fifth and final one before Friday night where I'm not really sure what he's doing. He waits, he waits, he waits, then he throws it to Well, Tim that's English. obvious. So that, that, that is obvious. And we don't, what we don't see is the amount of times that it has happened as well and the umpire hasn't paid a free kick. Yeah. So the AFL will find those and go, oh, it's happened before. But what they won't show us is how many times has it happened and the umpires just use some common sense and go, oh, give me the ball back, I'll throw it up. I'm yeah. sure that has happened as well. And I think there's a, a, a gripe as well with when the umpires actually wait for the ruckman to come and it takes more time than it would be to just throw the ball to the umpire. So there's a couple of interesting things there, but letter of the law, the decision was correct. All right, Luke Jackson was just about best on ground on Friday night. And you want to talk about him playing with Sean Darcy and without, because as you'll see here, when he's without Sean Darcy, it's just him playing as a solo ruck. And it's highlighted in the ranking points where he's averaging nearly 40 more Yeah, no, can't, it's just the most obvious thing, and anyone that has watched football would know that this combination is not going to work. You've got two highly paid ruckmen on long-term deals, and you're trying to force them into the same side, and it's not working. So when Darcy plays, he has to play forward, and he's not a forward. That is with Darcy. That's when he's forward. Look at it. It's all black. That's when he's the in the ruck, when he's vying for all Australian ruck duties. Mm. It just doesn't work. So I thought he was ineffective on Friday night. 11 touches, three kicks, not involved in anything. And that's the reason why, because Darcy is playing. So you've got six years of this. I, I think it's a gigantic issue for Fremantle, how they are going to coexist with those two highly paid ruckmen on contracts for six years after this. Yeah. I don't know what the solution is. The only solution is that Jackson plays forward, but you'll see him. He runs under the ball. He's got no timing in the air. He kicks his goals from the ruck at ground level follow-up. He's not a marking forward. So for the Fremantle Footy Club, they've made a serious error. It was obvious that this was going to be the case, and I'm not sure how they deal with it uh, for the long-term future. All right, let's get down to Tasmania now, where Port Adelaide rec recorded a pretty comfortable victory over North Melbourne. Jason Horn francis against his former side. Best on ground. 24 disposals, 10 clearances, 7 score involvements and a goal. Cop the boost throughout but really uh, rose above it and performed pretty well. Yeah, it would have hurt those North Melbourne fans booing him when you're seeing a guy that was on your list and he's doing this. Went forward as well, which he has done throughout the year. I mean, that's the thing that separates him from the good midfielders and the great midfielders. The ability to go forward and do this and he does it at crunch time. So he had 8 clearances at half time. A bit of push and shove. And he's not happy with some of his former teammates, but that is as to be expected. They put Liam Shields to him after half time. Mm. Now, Shields started on Butters, did a reasonable job, albeit Butters kicked a couple of goals in the first quarter. I, I don't know if you want a 33 year old tagging a 20 year old. Why wouldn't you say, okay, George Wardlaw, how about you and go and play on Jason Horn mm. Francis? Because Wardlaw couldn't really get near it early and he was ineffectual. I'd much rather see that opportunity go to George Wardlaw or Luke Davies Uniac to improve his defensive action rather than Liam Shields at his second club at 33 running around as a tagger playing like a caravan on Horn Francis. I don't get it. I saw Dersma kick a goal and Alistair Clarkson subs him out. 
I'm just not sure there's been any improvement this year. Well, I know there hasn't for that North Melbourne side and, and the tactics today, again, were questionable. Defensively is where everything is hurting North Melbourne at the moment. So you have a look. Another 107 points conceded today. They've conceded 100 in every single game they've played this season. So North Ball's working, isn't it? So you'd have to say, we absolutely stuffed up our pre-season where we were raving about our offence, our attack. Well, yeah, that's been good at the expense of actually defending. I mean, that, that is just horrific numbers. You would think that they need to bed down on the defensive action and the target's got to be, all right, a small little area of improvement. Let's keep a team under 100 points. Now, they mm. nearly did it to Port Adelaide today. That may be about as low as you can start, but it's better than getting... 100 kicked against you every week and losing by 10 goals every week. All right, let's get to Thursday night footy at Marvel Stadium now where Sydney got the job done over the Western Bulldogs. They moved to 10-1 on the season. Chad Warner, best player of the comp. He's is he? close to is it. He? 25 disposals, another four goals. He's Look just taking that. the mickey at the moment, he, isn't he? he? Everything. In every way is he taking the mickey. We spoke about him last week. And I'm more than happy to speak about him again today because he just brings a smile to your face when you're watching him play. He plays with a joy, he plays with flair, he takes the game on, he takes risks. What he has done, I, I just didn't know about his aerial ability and his, I mean, his work rate has been there. But this is what we're yeah, highlighting from behind the goals, like just the work rate to get himself in a really dangerous position. And that's why he's the best goal-kicking midfielder in the comp right now, because he's doing this, burning he off the opposition. He three dogs players. Yeah, man. and so defensively, the dogs, that's been their issue for a long time. That's Bontempelli, uh, their best player, arguably the best player in the game, and Warner makes him look silly. Does a ring around him and then sits on heads and takes that absolute screamer, and he was the difference mm. in the game, wasn't he? Three goals in the second half. Absolutely enormous and really was the only thing that got in the way of the Western Bulldogs recording an excellent win. Well, Luke Beveridge actually came out afterwards and praised the performance and said they actually did quite well given the backs to the wall nature with the injuries and the opposition. These were the stats. In every key metric, you could just about say the dogs were on top. In fact, they were on top. Yep. I just didn't get the score. Yeah, no, the board I thought they were much. pretty good. They came with a plan. I thought their on ball division was excellent. Now, clearly, the concussion to Richards hurt. Yeah. Uh, they had to change the matchup from. Jordan from Bailey to Richards, and then he got concussed. So that one hurt. Norton hurt, of course, as well. Mm. So they were really good. The only thing that really cost them was some of those skill errors yeah. that Sydney scored heavily off turnover. We're seeing some of them here. Like that, that is a no-pressure kick with no one around. That just can't happen. And the 50, mm, 50 is soft, but the 50 is there. That's an easy goal against. Goal from turnover. Jones, I mean, how many times do you see him drop a chest mark? Yeah. One of the best intercept marks in the game. Coughs it up. Goal off turnover. There's another one. I think they kicked 11 of them. So, mm. uh, once again, that's been... Uh, well, that was the issue for them. And when you get Gallagher and Bramble and their lesser lights that Luke Beveridge loves to play, then you're clearly going to get errors with these types of players in big moments, particularly with a high-pressure side like Sydney. And when they bring the heat, they bring the heat and they scored off turnover. And it will discipline as well. I mean, that one's a bit stiff, but uh, Sydney kicked five goals from free kicks or 50-metre penalties throughout the course of the evening. Two goals from 50s as well. So, yeah, I mean, the ill discipline stuff doesn't help. You can see Luke Beveridge there is obviously mm. frustrated with that fact as well. Some key injuries as well, as you mentioned. Aaron Norton, the biggest of them with this knee injury. It's interesting, they've banned this hip drop tackle in the NFL in the United States, in the yeah. NRL as well over here. You just wonder if they need to look at it going forward. I mean, it's the first time I've really seen it, but... It's a nasty one, so Aaron Norton expected me up to two months ago. Yeah, without. big blow because he was just starting to get into some really good form, but I guess best-case scenario for him is that he'll be back at some point not in the too distant future. All right, let's head to the rest of the round now. It starts on Sunday with Hawthorne taking on Brisbane at Marvel Stadium. Nam, one of a number of clubs going by their Indigenous name across the course of Sir Doug Nichols' round. They're playing St Kilda at the MCG, and then Adelaide Which taking team on fascinates you the most out of, out of those six? Who do you want to see something from? You need to see a response from the Saints. From the don't Saints, you? of you course you do. See. Can they score? Can, can they, they take goals? Can they score more than <laughs> 55 points? Come on, Ross, pull something out of your bag of tricks. All right, Kane, thanks for your help tonight. It's going to be a big week on afl.com.au. Gettable on Monday. And then don't forget, on Wednesday, the AFL mid-season rookie draft. All the picks live and exclusive as they happen. Who was that Everyone's old guy that nominated? Phil Brown. He's 50. He's 50. 50. You reckon you can still play? <laughs> no Would you nominate no this year, Kane? Chance. I reckon you can help out a few sides. Oh. We'll see you there next, see you next week as well. <laughs>